Hello. Welcome to our talks, Science Goes Public, with the Center of Communication and Outreach from the Max Planck Institute for Animal, of Animal Behavior. Thanks for being here today. Um, we have again a young scientist here, it's Iris Bonte Koo, and she will tell us about her work with storks today. The title of her um, talk is Watch Out Young Storks, Important Information for the First Big Trip of Some Storks. Um, for all those who haven't been with us in this um, program, you can inscribe yourself in the um, YouTube channel so you can also ask us questions and write them in the chat, please. So when Iris is finished with her talk, we will ask her all the questions you have and she will answer you all the questions that um, you gave her. Iris, welcome here. I'm happy to have you here. Um, I would like to ask you something about you. As I heard or know, you are since how long at our institute? So I came to the institute in June 2019. So that's almost two years ago now. And you are in a special program of our institute. I guess I don't know if we ever mentioned this here. Maybe you would like to mention a program which allowed you, I think, to come here. So I am in the IMPRS, which is International Max Planck Research School for Organismal Biology. And um, we get a lot of courses from them and we form cohorts so that we get people together. So it's a real cool thing to study together on in different groups of our institute. You are a lot, we have now a, a lot of young people in your age around. I remember when I started in the institute 10 years ago, there were maybe three or four people in your age doing this. And with the MPS, we had coming much, much, much more from countries all over the world. So you come originally from? I'm from the Netherlands. And you studied also in the Netherlands? You started to study in the Netherlands? Yes. So I did my bachelor's and master's at the University of Groningen. And would you like to tell us why storks? What, why did you finish up with the storks? So during my master's, I got interested in bird migration. And then that developed into a spe special interest in social migration. And the storks are social migrants, so they migrate in groups. And because storks are relatively big, we can put tags on them and then we get high precision data of where they go. So that's really cool about storks. And you told me before that also where you come from, which where I come from, there were no storks in youth, but in your youth, I guess you saw already storks there. Yes. Is that right? Yes, yes, I've seen storks in the Netherlands. Yeah. So, but not really in where in the town where you grew up. No. So, in the where I grew up, we didn't have storks nesting there, um, but in the village. Uh, close by, there was one of those poles with a stork nest on top. So there they were actually breeding. Very nice. So we have also around here some villages like this for people in the audience who are nearby and don't know these villages. Write us and we will tell you where to go to see storks near, more near. So now I would like to give over the talk to you. I'm really looking forward. I like this blackbird tonight, advice for young storks. And go ahead with your talk. We'll see you later again. And now we listen to you. We talk to you later again. And now we listen to you. <laughs> Thanks. So, hi, everyone. Thank you for coming. And Babette, thank you for introducing me. Today, I will share some important information with you about the first migration of young white storks. 
like these ones. I hope you are as excited as they are to learn what I found out. But before I dive into that, I will talk a bit about storks in general. I would like to start with this photo because every time I cycle to the office, I see this stork nest on top of the Brunt building in Mögingen. And depending on where you live, you may have seen storks nesting as well. We are now early June and the young storks are starting to prepare for their first flights. Right now, they are still being fed by their parents, but they will become independent soon. And then around mid-August, they will suddenly disappear. In the past, people were puzzled about where birds would go at the end of summer. And it was even thought that birds would spend the winter in the mud at the bottom of lakes. Storks were about the first to tell us that this is not true. Several storks like this one came back in spring with arrows in their bodies. These arrows came from Africa and this gave us the first suggestion that storks are actually spending the winter in Africa. Instead of relying on animal surviving hunting attempts during winter, we now use rings like this one that can be read by people all over the world. And more recently, we have started to use GPS tags that give us highly precise data on where the storks go and sometimes even on their behavior and energetics, which I think is amazing. From GPS data from storks that breed at different locations, we have learned where storks go. I am currently here in Southern Germany and the storks that breed here spent the winter in Sub-Saharan West Africa. But not all of the storks migrate that far. Some of them stay in Spain, Portugal, and Morocco. And the storks that stay there uh, feed on human waste on landfills. And landfills are an easy source of food for storks and storks can save energy by feeding there. After spending the winter in the south, storks fly back to Germany to breed. Storks already come back here at the end of winter, so it can still be pretty cold. Storks, um, storks nest high above the ground, for example, on top of a building or on these stork nesting poles. After the storks finish building their nests, they lay eggs and start breeding. After some time, the young storks come out of the eggs and the parents will start feeding them until the young storks can fly. Before they leave the nest, the young storks already start flapping their wings to strengthen their muscles. And here you can also already see how big the wings of a stork are compared to its body size. Just before the young storks start flying, we give some of them a tag, which you can see here. We attach a tag to the stork as a backpack, and these tags have solar panels so that the battery can recharge. And because of this, we can follow the storks in high detail for the rest of their lives. After tagging, we bring the storks back to their nest. And because storks nest so high above the ground, we often need help from the fire brigade to do the tagging. Towards the end of summer, when the young storks can fly, storks of all ages group together in large groups to feed and to prepare for migration. And storks can often be found on mown fields, and they often already come when a farmer is still mowing. So if you would like to see groups of storks eating, search for a mowing farmer and you will likely find them, at least if there are storks around where you live. Late summer is also a good time to see large groups of storks flying in the air. And when the time is ready, the storks take off on migration. Storks migrate in large groups like this one. Stork parents do not take their kids on migration. So these groups consist of mostly unrelated storks that can be of different ages. Early during the migration season, the migration flocks consist mostly of young storks. 
older storks tend to migrate a bit later. Especially for young birds, migrating in a group can be very beneficial. Young storks can learn from the older birds and they could even save energy because older storks know where and how to find food and good flight conditions. For storks, um, flapping flight like this stork is showing is really expensive or energy costly because they are relatively heavy birds. So storks try to avoid flapping their wings as much as they can. To be able to migrate and cover large distances without needing to flap, <coughs> and storks use so-called soaring gliding flights. And for this, they need thermals. <coughs> Thermals are columns of rising air <clears throat> that appear when the sun hits the ground. The warm air above the ground starts rising and storks and other soaring gliding birds can benefit from this by climbing up in the rising air. When a stork leaves the thermal, it glides down towards the next thermal when it can climb up again. By flying like this, storks can cover large distances without flapping their wings. So this is very energy efficient. To summarize the most important or important parts so far um, on the timeline, we're now early June and the young storks will leave their nest soon and start flying around. Then mid-August, they will start their migration to the south. As I told you, the young storks leave earlier than their parents do. So the groups in which young storks fly usually consist of mainly other young storks. But we don't really know why these sto young storks leave earlier than their parents. It can be very beneficial for young animals to um, follow and learn from experienced other animals like their parents. With my research, I'm trying to find out why young storks are not migrating later to be able to benefit from the experience of older storks. To be able to find out, I need to somehow find young storks that migrate late. There is some natural variation in the timing of migration, but it is really difficult to get enough information on the extremely late young storks. To work around this, we have done an experiment. We took some young storks out of their nest before they started flying. We put them in an aviary. And then around mid-September, we left them out, after which they could start migrating to the south. And this way, the young storks would migrate in groups with mostly adults instead of with younger storks, what they usually do. So I have two groups that I compare. I have an early group that migrates at normal timing and in groups with mostly young storks. Then I have a late group from which we experimentally delayed the migration of some young storks um, so that they migrate in groups with mostly adult storks. I will compare the migration of these two groups to hopefully find out why young storks are not mig migrating late to be able to benefit from the experience of the older storks. Before I start a comparison, I will tell you a bit more about our experiment. Here you see the young storks in the aviary. We were lucky enough to get a lot of assistance from Affenberg Salem. They have an aviary in which they usually keep injured storks that need some time to recover. And they kindly allowed us to keep some young storks in the aviary to delay their migration. The storks have been in the aviary till mid-September and then it was time to release them. Before we released the storks, we took some measurements like their weight and the size of their beak. And then, as you can see here, we wrap them up and then we put them into boxes to safely transport them to the release site. 
We brought the storks to an area in which there are no other storks present. After giving the storks some time to recover from the transport, they were free to stretch their wings and fly without limits for the very first time in their lives. From this moment, there was no more protection from the aviary around them, and there was no more pre-delivered food. So they were basically all by themselves and they could go wherever they wanted to go. I followed the storks around for a couple of days after the release and I noticed something completely unexpected. The storks usually sleep high above the ground on buildings or on poles or more naturally on trees. But the storks that we had in the aviary slept in the middle of fields, so on the ground, and this comes with certain dangers. But luckily, after a few days, the storks met other storks, and then they suddenly started sleeping on roofs. This already indicates that the young storks need others to teach them things that seem basic to us, like where to sleep. And soon after they met other storks, they started migrating. And with that, I could start comparing the, stor the storks from the aviary to the other group of storks that I have. To quickly recap, I have two different groups from which I compare the migration. I have an early group that migrates at normal timing in groups with mostly young storks. Then I have the late group that consists of young storks from which the migration is experimentally delayed and that migrate mostly in groups with adult storks. I compare the migration of these two groups to find out why young storks are not migrating later to be able to benefit from the experience of adults. So first we will have a look at where all of my storks went. So in, on this map in light blue, you see the tracks, the GPS tracks from the migration of the early storks in light blue. And there are the late storks in dark blue. So here I added the final locations where the storks went as yellow and white dots. All of the early storks migrated at least to southern Spain or Morocco. And quite a couple of them continued all the way to sub-Saharan West Africa. The late storks did not migrate that far. They only got farthest to, southern, to northern Spain. As you can see, the migration of the late storks is substantially shorter than the migration of the early storks. So late storks migrate shorter distances. And as you can see, there are still some white dots over there in the north. So we're going to zoom in on that. Some of the late storks did not migrate. They stayed locally. And the young storks that did not migrate were likely too late to join the last group of migrating storks. And this suggests that young white storks are not able to migrate to their wintering areas without adult storks to guide them. So young storks need guidance. In addition to the migration distance and destinations, I also looked at migration at a finer scale. To do this, I looked at a segment of the migration that overlaps between all of the migrating storks. And here you see the segment. It starts here in Southern Germany and it goes all the way to the Mediterranean coast of France. I will use this segment to uh, look into migration speed at different scales. And in the end, I will use this segment to look into energy expenditure during migration. So let's get started on the migration speed. I looked at how long it takes the storks to cover the segment. That means I calculated the number of days between flying into the segment from the north and flying out of the segment in the south. 
And that is the number of days that you see here. On the x-axis here, you see the date at which the stork first flew into the segment. And for now, I will only show the early storks that migrate at normal time. So what you see here is that the storks that enter the segment early August show a lot of variation in how long it takes them to cover this segment. Some even take more than two weeks. And for the storks that enter the segment at the end of August, they show much less variation and the high values are not there. So this suggests that the storks that um, migrate at the beginning of August have the opportunity to take multiple stopovers or at least stop for multiple days. For the storks at the end of the migration season, so at the end of August, there may not be um, flocks of mig groups of migrating storks coming through. So if they stop for too long, they may miss the last group and end, end up being there all alone. So now I get clay group in there as well. So here you see the same information as that I show here. It is just squeezed together into one column. And for the late storks, I expect that they have a fast migration so that they have a low number of days here. That is because the storks that um, migrate late August already are quite fast. And the late storks are even later than they are. And this is also what I found in the data. So late storks migrate faster. And this is likely to avoid being left behind. So in addition to the differences in group composition, the late young storks also experience differences in, for example, day length. The early storks experience day lengths between 13 and 15 hours during migration. The late storks, on the other hand, only experience between 12 and 12 and a half hours of day length during migration. You can probably imagine that this can have an effect on the time that the stork can spend flying each day. Storks only migrate during the day because then they can use thermals and save a lot of energy while flying. In line with what I would expect, the late storks spent less time flying each day. So late storks fly for a shorter time each day. So now we know that the late storks fly a shorter time each day. What do you think that would mean for the distance that these storks fly each day? I would expect that the late storks cover a shorter distance than the early storks because they spend less time flying. This is actually not true. The late storks actually have a higher daily distance, so they fly farther. So the combination of a shorter flight time and a larger distance would mean that the late storks fly faster than the early storks. The late storks migrate in groups with mostly adult storks. These adult storks have much more experience, so they are better flyers and they know where to go. And therefore, adults are likely able to cover larger distances per day. The young storks that fly with adults seem to benefit from this experience. So from the result that we see here, it seems that it's beneficial or a good thing for young storks to migrate late because they can reach their destination faster. I promise you to talk a bit about energetics as well, and this is a good moment for that. I have the flapping rate as a measure for energy expenditure during migration. Flapping flight takes a lot of late storks have a higher flapping rate than the early storks. So late storks spend more energy during migration than early storks. 
I showed you before that late storks cover larger distances per day, and I explained that this is probably because they can benefit from the experience of adults. A disadvantage of flying with experienced adults is that they are likely better flyers than the young storks. The higher flapping rate of late storks indicates that the young storks have to flap their wings more to keep up with the adults. So even though they may reach their destination faster, the late young storks spend more energy during migration. Now we go back to the nest in Meggingen because I would like to give some advice to these young storks. My first advice is, please young storks, sleep high up and stay with other storks. You can learn a lot from them. And when it comes to migration timing, do not leave too late because you may miss the last flock and then you can end up being all alone, not knowing what to do. Also, migrating early will save you a lot of energy during flight. And lastly, I have an advice for all of you humans. If you are interested in following the movements of storks and other animals throughout the year, download the Animal Tracker app. All tagged storks that I talked about today are in there as well. So you can even see where they are right now. And with that, I would like to hand over to Babette. Thank you for listening. I'm here again, I'm coming. Okay, thanks very much for your really nice talk. Um, I have a lot of questions in my head, um, but I must admit that I already traveled with young storks um, to Spain. And um, I have a question. Normally, as I know, the time when they leave First, the first stocks is around the 10th of August, at least near Mörgingen and Böhringen. Mm -hmm. Yes. So I'm not sure when is the later when the latest leaf normally. Um so the latest leaf, well, the end of August, maybe the beginning of September. But we found out that even during mid-September, there are still storks migrating to the south. Okay. And you know why they there are some who leave later? Does this depend on when they come out of the egg or? So the young storks leave a bit earlier than their parents. And yes, um, for the adult storks, I don't know why they are leaving so late. It could have to do something with their nesting success. So if they have to feed their young for a long time, they may have to recover a bit afterwards. There is a question here in the audience. Um, do you think that the young storks communicate actively with older ones or do they just mimic their, beha their behavior? Um, I think there can be some direct communication, but I think that in general, the young storks are just following the older storks and thereby imitating what they do. So do you, is there any, I, I don't have an idea, it's just because this question is here in the audience, I, I ask, um, do you have any idea if there is kind of communication in between the storks? Is there any research about this? Um, like active communication, I am not aware that there is research about that right mm -hmm. now. Okay. At least during migration. And something which I was also wondering, um, those storks who fly, the older ones who fly later, And as I understood, they make more kilometers in less time. Yes. 
but they go farther ahead or than the younger. So they reach, go more south or they also keep more north staying. So um, there, has, there has been some research on how far storks uh, migrate. And it turns out that when they get older, they migrate shorter distances. So they stay closer uh, to home, basically. Or to the good places they know. So I yes. was wondering, because I, like I saw, when I saw the map, I know some very good dump stations around where the, the, the second group stopped over now, which I yeah. saw. No? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that the landfills seem to have an influence on the migration distance of the storks. But then, then it's strange also that the younger one, the, the early flyers, go farther ahead so maybe they are the more curious ones or they know they have more time or it's strange yeah we have here another question how long does a migration to africa usually take and how many breaks do they have you know something about this oh that's a good question um i don't know exactly how long it takes them I know that it, it can depend also a bit on the weather conditions. Like when they have the wind from their back, they can fly farther on a certain day. Um, they can they can fly even 400 kilometers per day. But um, most of the storks that go to Africa will have a stop in Spain or Morocco on the landfills likely. There is a new question also here. Do you think that keeping the late strokes in the aviaries might have also had an effect on their behavior resting on the ground or resting on the ground? Um, so as you could see on the photo, we had uh, beams in the aviary and the storks were sleeping on there at night in the aviary. And also after we released the storks, there was one that really quickly was standing on the roof. So they, they know how to get on the roof and they know how to sleep high above the ground. Um, but they somehow just didn't do it. And I, I think it has to do with uh, the absence of like someone who shows that you should sleep on the roof. So it seems that they need other storks um, to teach them that. Mm -hmm. And I don't expect that it's purely an aviary effect. It's just they apparently don't know that from themselves. So you had them in the aviaries and the nests were also in the aviaries? Not, no. So the nests were outside the aviaries mm -hmm. and they, ha they have been on the nest for seven weeks. So um, we left them there with their parents so that their parents could take care of them. And then we took them out and put them in the aviary as late as possible. You told me before that um, this is what, these are the, you worked with the storks who come from Salem Affenberg. Yeah. There since a couple of years, I'm not sure how many years there are a lot of storks breeding there also. A lot of them go to Spain and come back, as I know, or go south even further. And um, you also were after the breeding season and the aviaries, you went to the fields. So you saw where you storks, your first storks flew at the beginning. Yeah. What did they do? Do can you tell us something about what they do in the first? So in the first like days after we released them, um, they were mostly um, standing and walking around a bit, uh, feeding. They took some flights when the conditions were good, and sometimes there were um, buzzards or kites flying around, and then they joined them in the thermals. And did you go got get to know also 
Um, sorry. Did you get to know some of the strokes more personally, not not like no, but it, were differences between the what I'm interested in um, between the personalities of the early flyers and late flyers? Did you notice um, anything on that? So I don't have information on the storks in the early group. Um, okay. While the storks were in the aviary, I have done some feeding experiments to find out which ones are dominant over the others. Um, this is still work in progress, but hopefully in some time I can also tell you something about um, personalities or individuality. That would be nice. <laughs> And um, you are working also at the group from Andrea Flack. Yeah. She has now a special group. Can you tell something about the group a little? Um, so we work on the social migration uh, of white storks. And part of what we do is um, the experiments that I told you about. And besides that, we are tagging young storks and we follow uh, their migration. And in the end, we try to find out how social information can influence the migration of uh, storks. A very nice work what you do. So I really like it. Um, I don't see any more questions at the moment. And um, I hope we see you again here. You will stay for, you will, for, I think, at least one or two years more. Yes. And when you have done, when you have finished your work, maybe you can tell us again something about this, which would really be nice. Sure. I think we will take your advice, or at least... I would I would take the youngsters to take their advice to sometimes um, hear what the older ones do and maybe learn from them. It's nice to have different schools. Um, thank you very much, Iris, for this talk. Yeah. And I would like to tell the audience if you want to know more about other talks we, are give, we will give here or the, our young scientists um, give here, you can um, subscribe to our newsletter. You can also um, join our Instagram um, for, um, program and you can also have a look on our homepage, which is really nice. The next talk will be in German. It's from Andrea Kölsch and it's called From Gänse und Menschen, Acht Jahre Wildgansbewanderung. Andrea Kölsch is an older scientist and she really is looking long years on this um, piece and it's worldwide to have a look in this. Thank you for, very much for um, being here. I hope you enjoyed the talk and we hope to see you soon again. Thank you. Bye.